just about everything that is ultimately going to be called postmodernism is found in the modernism of Borges' The Library of Babel. It is a wild, wild little piece. Um, exactly what it is, is a bit of a mystery. Is it an essay? Is it a short story? Is it a metafiction? Uh, is it a performance? Uh, all of this is a fair question. There's really no settled per opinion on any of this. It is uh, a deep reflection of Borges the man. I think that's fairly obvious, aside from the superficial biographical stuff of uh, he was a career librarian for much of his life. He uh, was also very, uh, very international and very deeply, uh, deeply ingrained in the world literature scene of his day. He was fluent in several languages and read and reviewed and wrote in many different languages and traditions, both popular and academic, he, uh, and, and high art and low. He was a, uh, a remarkable character. And all of this deeds into this, uh, this story. And I'm gonna keep calling it a story because it kind of is. Um, it lays itself out as a kind of essay. In the, uh, in the grand tradition of Montaigne, however, it is a somewhat meandering discussion around a topic and kind of ends up in a different place where it began. So there's that. It, uh, you can trace a little bit of a plot through it, and many critics do, and it's kind of a fun parlor game to try. Um, but what he is laying out essentially is a plan of the uh, some grand abstract library, the Library of Babel. Obviously, Babel is the biblical uh, the, the the biblical biblical story of the tower that uh, humanity was building a tower that was going to pierce the heavens into, uh, into God's domain. And so God, feeling a little defensive and not, like, not wanting uh, to be crowded, decided to confuse their languages and thus create different languages so that all these people working together to create this tower that's going to rival God, or at least mm, elbow into his territory, they could no longer communicate, thus they could no longer work together, thus they could no longer build and achieve and rival divinity. Uh, this is the profusion of languages around the world. The Library of Babel starts from that basic concept of uh, profusion and confusion um, in, in, in all of their terms. Uh, <clears throat> the universe, which others call the library, is composed of an indefinite and perhaps infinite number of hexagonal galleries with vast air shafts between, surrounded by very low railings. Um, this isn't even an essay here. This seems like a plan, like a, uh, an architectural plan or perhaps a description. It seems to exist. And uh, this is just describing the uh, outward physical material structure of this idea. Um, and whether or not it is real is open to some debate. Certainly for this character uh, who is writing this essay or telling this story or whatever he's doing, it is very real. But it's quickly apparent that for the reader, for us, it is uh, a pure confection of the imagination. Um, think in terms of, well, the hexagon is the, the simple unit of the honeycomb and all of these little units, and they build on one another indefinitely and perhaps in, in, infinitely. They go on forever. This is a non uh, non terminating 
uh, existence. And he goes into great detail describing how uh, how how the shelves are all laid out how the books are all laid out on the shelves everything is identical from one to the other everything is uh is uniform in in its way it is very difficult to uh to tell what book it is from the spine you have to be apparently uh you, know, you have to be aware of the code for this to be a librarian um all of the books uh, come in, uh, what is it, uh, a specific number of characters, a limited vocab, a limited uh, alphabet, if you will, including only uh, the only punctuation allowed are commas and periods, I believe. Um, it is a very regularized, rigidly structured reality that is at once quite breathtaking in its scope and at the other um, the other extreme is quite horrifying because it's so imposing um, <laughs> well we'll get there some of the little details are sort of fun too because as he's laying out all of this he's he he takes repeated uh, he pays repeated attention to the the uh, the basic humanity within all of this, i.e. the librarians themselves. There don't seem to be any readers themselves in this. There don't seem to be anybody who really reads, but there seems to be staff of librarians who wander throughout this honeycomb um, indefinitely. Um, but, you know, to my left and right in the hallway, there are two very small closets. In the first, one may sleep standing up. Sounds comfy. In the other, satisfy one's fecal necessities. <laughs> because, you know, everybody poops. Um, it, it, is, uh, it is at once uh, very, you know, harrowing and at the other just sort of charming in, in the specificity. But go from that very, like, crude, animal-like attention to human nature and immediately thereafter um, also also through here passes a spiral stairway which sinks abysmally and soars soars upwards to remote distances a um, couple things here uh, that after the poop joke uh, you get this image of just absolute um, abstraction uh, a spiral staircase that sinks abysmally and soars upward to remote distances. Abysmally is used, I think, here, uh, even in translation, in both senses of it is uh, both literally going down into an abyss, but also something about the experience of it, the emotion it evokes, is abysmal. It is somehow quite dark and harrowing. Um, and this is um, repeated throughout. This is a continual undercurrent. Um, the, uh, the, there is a very Kafka-esque quality to this. Um, Kafka loves his labyrinthine little realities that um, uh, are, one, are at once both unrecognizable in their bizarre bizarreness and at the same time completely recognizable from a human psychological standpoint we understand immediately what Kafka's reality is referencing even if it's not like oh yeah okay I was I was on that street corner um, there's no recognition in that sense but there is a kind of emotive um, identification with the world as he perceives it. And you get exactly that in Borges. Borges was, I believe, a big fan of Kafka. So again, he was Mr. You know, reading in a dozen different languages at any one time. So he's working around the same time. He probably knew his Kafka very, very well. The, um, 
um, little things, you know, uh, like all men of the library, I have traveled in my youth. I have wandered in search of a book, perhaps the catalog of catalogs. Uh, I'm not sure if he's speaking allegorically here or not, but it does sound an awful lot like he's just saying, you know, I have traveled extensively in the library, which of course is a, a possible to be uh, considered extensive since it is after all largely and conceivably uh, infinite. It goes on forever. So you can just wander forever through this library. And you know, it's, it's a funny little thing. But at the same time, you can also see that, you know, uh, wander in search of a book, perhaps the catalog of catalogs, uh, which has a certain godlike quality to it. Like, you know, I'm searching for the catalog of catalog, the list of all lists which is ultimately uh, the Book of God, which is where he goes with this very soon. Um, this, uh, what is it? Uh, the mystery, the, the idealists argue that the hexagonal rooms are a necessary form of absolute space or at least of our intuition of space. They reason that the triangular or pentagonal pentagonal room is inconceivable, which sounds like uh, your basic idealist philosophy paper right there. Um, the mystics claim, so now he's taking a different, uh, still in the idealist realm, but something a little bit different, again, channeling, channeling through um, these, these heavily, these heavy terms, these heavy philosophical terms and modes of reading and perceiving the world that as a librarian he would be fluent in, as an intellectual he would be fluent in, as a world literature internationalist he would be fluent in, but still he has the perspective to say it is all rather absurd, isn't it? Uh, but then, you know, the mystics claim that their ecstasy reveals to them a circular chamber containing a great circular book whose spine is continuous and which follows the complete circle of the walls, which is starting to get very abstract and very enormous. And then, of course, he, he, he declares this cyclical book is God. And here we're in the medieval. Here we're in the Middle Ages. This is medievalism, the idea of the book of God. God is a book through which we can read. You can look around the world and see God's majesty laid out before you like a book. This is all over the place. You can find it in Dante, you can find it in Thomas Aquinas, you can find it everywhere in the Middle Ages, particularly the late Middle Ages, particularly in Europe. But that concept, God is a book. Um, so who would be better to speak about him than a librarian? Hmm. More than a priest? Laying out the specifics of the, uh, of the library, the shape of it, the, uh, the layout of it, getting very, very detailed, very, very specific. Um, I know that this o o incoherence at one time seems mysterious before summarizing the solution whose discovery, in spite of its many, many tragic projections, is perhaps the capital fact in history, I wish to recall a few axioms. Again, we're relating to the, we're, uh, we're, we're returning to these uh, semi-scientific, humanities-based, social science, philosophical terms, axioms is uh, a term from logic and he's trying to create a kind of logic a mental exercise if, uh, if you will and axioms are truths they are irreducible truths from which you can start to extrapolate through reason and saying okay i know this is true so i will start to build upon that to uh construct my conception of the broader universe but the attention to truth, or at least the struggle for it, as a building block. And well, what if that truth seems equally vulnerable? Oh, what happens to your perception of the world? Um, the
the ca there are no real characters in uh, in this uh, short story, if you will. Uh, beyond the uh, the essayist, the librarian himself, but he does allude to other groups of people uh, within this milieu, uh, the Vindicators. <clears throat> A group of people uh, who, uh, would, 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 well, let's see, uh, all, let's see, when it was proclaimed that the library contained all books, the first impression was one of extravagant happiness. All men felt themselves to be the masters of an intact and secret treasure. There was no personal or world problem whose eloquent solution did not exist in some hexagon. The universe was justified. The universe suddenly usurped the, u the unlimited dimensions of hope. At that time, a great deal was said about the vindicators, the vindications, books of apology and prophecy, which vindicated for all time the acts of every man in the universe and retained prodigious arcana for the future. Vindicated for all time the acts of every man in the universe. People who are going to go dig into the books to find excuses for anything and everything. Hmm. These pilgrims disputed in the narrow corridors, proffered dark curses, strangled each other on the divine stairways, flung the deceptive books into air shafts, met their death cast down in a similar fashion by the inhabitants of remote regions. Others went mad. A uh, very dark little vision here of these people running around the stacks, if you will, trying to seek out uh, justification for their actions, justifications for the actions of people they know, justifications for anything and everything, um, and willing to use violence in pursuit of it. Hmm. Um, at that time, it was also hoped that a clarification of humanity's basic mysteries, the origin of the library and of time, might be found. A clarification of basic mysteries. There are official searchers, the inquisitors. I have often seen them in the performance of their function. They have always arrived extremely tired from their journeys. They speak of a broken stairway which almost killed them. They talk of the librarian of galleries and stairs. Sometimes they pick up the nearest volume and leaf through it looking for infamous words. Obviously, no one expects to discover anything. The Inquisitors. Here, they're just searching for answers which they're never really going to find. Hmm. The final group, others inversely believe that it was fundamental to eliminate useless works. They invaded the hexagons, showed credentials which were not always false, leafed through a volume with displeasure and condemned whole shelves. Their hygienic, ascetic furor caused the senseless perdition. Of millions of books. Perdition. Flames. Um, this is about book burning. We're starting to see uh, portraits evolve here, and where it's it's it is important to take this abstract, and he's dealing in very abstract terms. There are no names anywhere. Dealing in very abstract terms, he published this story in 1941, I believe, while he was essentially stuck in Switzerland, unable to travel because of World War II and the Nazis. Um, so what is going on in his mind right here? In a, uh, uh, in a, in a, in a state where uh, he was probably not allowed to publish particularly freely or think or express particular thoughts freely. Um, 
he is thinking about, uh, well, people who are looking for excuses for behavior and lashing out in violence to get it. Uh, he is thinking about uh, feckless little philosophers and moralists who are running around seeking answers to life's mysteries, but not accomplishing anything. And he sees book burning and the people who are censorious about what is proper to be read or thought or expressed. If you look just beneath it, you see these little currents flowing underneath the words. This existential reality that is bubbling under there. But he's not going there. He is not explicitly talking about anything. And so he can be talking about anything. The beauty of pure abstraction, which is really what he's dealing with here, is that it is uh, universal. Anybody can do it. We have people today, certainly, who go around and saying, you shouldn't be writing that, you shouldn't be thinking that, or you certainly shouldn't be reading that. That's fake news. Uh, there is uh, there is never a shortage of people who go around and seek uh, comfort in the words that excuse horrific behavior. If you were to write the word Nazi in any of this, it would fixate it in that time, that place, that reality, that context. By keeping it abstract, it doesn't. By keeping it abstract, it has absolute validity for today, horrifyingly enough for us. The, the beauty of the abstraction, and he keeps it very short, this whole essay, if you want to call it an essay, is very short um, and very charming, and he tosses out the little poop jokes every now and then. Uh, He's playing to his audience on a different level than explicit reality. He's playing to his audience in a very uh, abstract medium. And so he can play to any audience who can come to him. He is open. He is, you can argue about him endlessly. He provides zero answers about what he's really got and anybody can open up this uh this little story and start to formulate their own opinion of it and it comes very quickly he's not that hard to really uh engage with and there's it's so open and yet so uh productive within itself that you can lash latch on to all different things and create the meaning for yourself and here that is largely modernism. Um, the, uh, the questions of the questions of form, of whether or not it is an essay or a story or whatever, a psychological monologue, soliloquy of despair, who knows? Um, that is that's more postmodernism to be quite honest he's playing he likes to play within genres and remind people consistently that well this isn't real this isn't real this is fake this is fake this is abstract this is imaginary um, because it lets you sit there and reflect well what about it is real what about it isn't so imaginary how can I take something from this that isn't just pure ephemera does it have anything to offer beyond that? And usually the, uh, the pieces that are most humble about, no, this is all just make-believe, usually those are the ones that have the most to glean. And Borges is one of those. Borges gives you so much that is so prescient, that is so uh, immediate, that has 
uh, validity for his time and place, but also for, quite honestly, the future. He is, uh, he is remarkable in this vision for opening up what a lot of people see is a vision of the internet. Now, he wrote this in the 40s, he died in 86, but right after his little discussion, or really right in his discussion of the purifiers, um, he talks about uh, the, the rich, well, the absurdity of their task of trying to expunge corrupt works because it is uh, their efforts are swallowed by the profusion of the of the media. Um, the library is so enormous that any reduction of uh, human origin is infinitesimal. The other, uh, every copy is unique, irreplaceable. But since the library is total, there are always several hundred thousand imperfect facsimiles, which will would which differ only in a letter or a comma. So. Uh, you just can't kill something once it gets away from you. Once it leaches out into the ether <clears throat> of culture, it's, uh, it's beyond your grasp and you cannot kill it. Now, he was dealing in a fairly idealistic way uh, with the idea of, you know, you can't kill an idea. Um, I think there's a good argument as well that he was talking about, well, okay, in a, uh, in a context of world literature, of internationalism, where with instant communication via the telephone at this point, uh, we are so connected that you cannot kill an idea, you cannot squelch it, there is no longer the illusion of control that even this enormous, vast, infinite library cannot contain that is that's the internet quite honestly that is uh, a cyber reality when uh, before even TV was a thing this is a vision of culture a vision of uh, humanism that is new in the world that modernism brings to it and prods people to have a perspective on it, to have a uh, to have an awareness of its power, its limitations, of what the medium can do to the message. The uh, the essay itself ends in a kind of uh, existential despair um, I would say uh, it's very troubling it's very uh, uncertain um, and here I can see a kind of denouement where the beginning starts out very again if you look at this as a story it does have a little bit of a through line the beginning starts out fairly uh, uh, descriptive and fairly physical and materialist. Uh, 20 shelves, five long shelves for sides, cover all sides except two. Their height, which is the distance from floor to ceiling, scarcely exceeds that of a normal bookcase. All very recognizable, all very physical, all very concrete and real. But then look how he describes the library at the end but the library will endure. Illuminated, solitary, infinite, perfectly motionless, equipped with precious volumes, useless, incorruptible, secret. That's all very abstract. Um, the words that jump out to me, of course, is infinite. He was hedging on whether or not it was infinite before, but now he's declaring it infinite. Um, useless? It's such a profusion you get lost in it, which is, again, the modernist uh, uh, dilemma of feeling the crushing burden of centuries and millennia of culture and tradition bearing down upon you. And can you imagine what that feels like for someone who sees himself as an internationalist with the accumulated culture of the entire world bearing down upon you? How do you write something new? Uh, no one, he writes, no one can articulate a syllable which is not, uh, which is not filled with tenderness and fear. Uh, that sense of 
the humanity at the heart of literature. Um, <clears throat> how do you get your, how do you wrap your mind around that? Uh, filled with tenderness and fear, that is not a regular, you know, descriptive like you get in the blueprint that he lays out at the beginning. If an eternal traveler were to cross it in any direction, the library, after centuries he would see that the same volumes were repeated in the same disorder, which, thus repeated, would be in order, the order. My solitude is gladdened by this elegant hope. That's the final line. That's beginnings and endings. That's where he ends up. The idea that if the library is unlimited and cyclical. It has some value. It has some validity. It is not, in fact, useless after all. It has the pretense or the illusion, if needed, of order, an order, evidence of a divine mission, evidence of design something that's not sheer chaos which is always lurking behind every modernist idea the fear that we're all just in chaos my solitude is gladdened by this elegant hope elegant is a bit arch and it's intended to be he knows it's a lie I would say. But the lie of that elegant hope, which is faith, the lie gladdens his solitude. The library thus becomes a church. It can provide a solace, a feeling of comfort for those of us who are just wandering around in solitude. And that word solitude reminds you that there really are no other individuals in this library. You hear little stories about a librarian here or there, again, no real readers. Uh, you hear about the groups of people, the purifiers and the vindicators and whatever. Um, there are no, there's no humanity beyond the animal that is reflected in the, you know, the poop jokes. Um, there is something quite horrifying about that. There, it's an enormous Kafka-esque uh, impenetrable monolith, this library this world, this universe, where nothing makes any sense, where there is nothing identifiable, uh, there are no individualized books except for a couple of joke titles that he throws in there to show how incomprehensible it all is. There's nothing that provides solace beyond the idea of the library. There's nothing individuated within it. It's just a pure idea. And you can say that it is a horrifying idea. You can say that it is a comforting idea. You can say anything you want because you alone, in your solitude, have to come to that conclusion. That's modernism.